would like for us to be perfectly clear on one thing. I am not, nor have I ever been, a dishonest woman. What I mean to say is, I am not a prostitute. Please do not make the mistake of listing my name among the others. I am not one of them. I don't mean to sound unkind. I, I understand well enough that they aren't completely to blame for their condition. I hear some of them are widows. Well, to be certain, they have contributed to their own downfall in states by the consumption of alcohol. In that respect, they must bear the blame for their fates. However, I do understand the vagaries and the cruelties of life, which can force a decent woman down a path she'd rather not walk. I do feel sympathy for these women, even if I cannot fully identify with them. I simply cannot conceive of myself, no matter how difficult the circumstances in life, ever turning to drink, but they certainly didn't deserve what happened to them. No woman deserves such a thing as that. I cannot identify with them in that I am not a drunkard and am not a prostitute. In one respect, I could have been like them, however. But for the grace of God and my own caution, I could have been one of the Ripper's victims. That is why I am here. Not because I lost my life to that monster, thank God I was spared that sad fate. But I did see him. I spoke to him. Or rather, he spoke to me. He had designs on making me one of his conquests. I am an honest woman, as I have told you. I work as a laundress. I'm also a married woman. Mrs. Peter Lewis. Sarah Lewis. We are poor, but honest, hard-working folk. My husband is a good man. Admittedly, he can sometimes be hard to get along with. We don't quarrel often, but this was one of the rare occasions. I had gone to stay with some of our friends at Miller's Court, the Keelers. Please don't construe from this that my marriage was unstable. I had gone away for a few days to teach Peter a lesson, that's all. I wanted him to know how much he needed me how difficult it would be to get on without me. I wanted him, if I'm to be honest, to come and fetch me, to beg me to come home. Which he did, after what happened to that poor woman at Miller's Court, practically next door to where I had been staying. The thought that something like that might potentially happen to me, now that put a good scare into my husband, it did. Came running to fetch me home, and let me tell you, he's been on the straight and narrow since then. It could have been me. The realization of that terrified my Peter, and it terrifies me. When I think of it, it's better not to think of it. I saw him, Jack the Ripper. I know it was him as well as I know my own name. It was the 7th, I believe, the 7th of November. A few days before what happened to that poor Kelly woman, we were out. My friend, her name is also Sarah, Sarah Keeler. We were out on honest business, shopping. She had a small parcel she was carrying at the time. You would think that that fact alone would inform any thinking man that we were not the sort of fallen women. A prostitute carrying parcels, honestly. He must have mistaken us for such, even though we were quite clean and looked presentable. We are poor women, Sarah and I, but we, the both of us, both do our best to always look presentable. Surely our dresses were not so shabby as those of the, as those types of women. And they were, and they were everywhere, let me tell you. Right after the devil murders, you wouldn't see a woman on the streets after dark. Any woman. We were all too afraid. Only the policemen and those of the vigilance committees on patrol, now they were everywhere. The women were all safe behind locked doors. Now, that last goes a long way for me in refuting what the common women say, that they have no homes or safe domiciles to go to. They certainly went somewhere in those days immediately following the devil murders because they were not on the streets, let me tell you. But after a few days passed and there were no fresh killings. We all began to relax, to come out of hiding. 
It took a bit longer for the honest women folk, but the unfortunates were back at it soon enough. We were all sadly mistaken to have hoped that the increased patrols on the east end had driven the river to ground. It was, as I stated, Wednesday the 7th. Sarah and I were out shopping. We were a few streets over from Sarah's home on Miller's Court. We passed this man. He was just standing there watching us. We paid him no heed. Or rather, we pretended to pay him no heed. The truth of the matter being that he quite unnerved us the way he was looking at us. I didn't say anything and neither did Sarah, but I could tell by her bearing that it made her uncomfortable as well. We hurried past him, our heads down, but he called after us. Evening, ladies. There was nothing particularly threatening about his voice. Would either of you like to earn a few coins for your purses? We pretended not to hear him, but then he said, I have enough of both of you if you want to come along with me. Well, I couldn't abide that. I suppose prudence would have dictated that I continue on my way, but I turned on him. I do not presume, sir, I said, to speculate as to what type of women you believe us to be, but our husbands might well take offense to your familiarity with us. And good night to you, sir. I dare say I surprised him. I surprised myself as well. His eyebrows raised a little and he smiled. The coldest smile. And then Sarah pulled me by the arm and we hurried on. That fiend, I said under my breath. I spoke more truly than I realized. I thought we were rid of him and glad I was of it, but he caught up with us at the next intersection. My dear ladies, I fear I have offended you, he said, contrite and quite proper. I beg you to accept my humble apologies. And with that, he doffed his top hat that he was wearing like a regular gentleman. Of course, sir, Sarah, Sarah said to him. We made to move on, but he stepped in front of us. He wasn't a large man, no more than average, but I cannot overemphasize the feeling of menace he imparted. Please do allow me to make it up to you in some way, he said. Our husbands are expecting us, sir, I said. We must be off. Again, with that smile. What I mean to say is regarding the man's appearance is he had no distinguishing marks, no scars, no signs of degeneracy in his face. He looked placid enough as far as features go. It was his... It was his expression more than anything else. He had a, a hardness about his face, a, a cruelty in his smile. His eyes, they were the blackest eyes I've ever seen in a man. He was wearing a dark overcoat and carrying a black satchel, something akin to what a barrister or a doctor might carry. I'd heard rumors that the Whitechapel killer was spotted after one of the murders and he was carrying a black satchel. I don't know why I didn't scream. There were people around. I didn't want to appear silly. Imagine me hailing a policeman and having to explain myself. And what reason have you, ma'am, that this man is Jack the Ripper? What would I have said? He has a cruel smile. Why, officer, look at how, how black his eyes are. I might have been laughed at. One more of the countless hysterical women, suspicious of every man, jumping at every shadow. And then Sarah had me up by the arm, pulling me away. And doubtless I told myself on the way home that that man is perfectly harmless. That there was nothing of consequence in that satchel. It's all in your imagination, I told myself. But I knew better. I'd known. I'd known that I had just been in the presence of Jack the Ripper. When that poor woman across the way was killed, I couldn't help but think, if only I'd screamed. If, if only I'd done something, that woman would still be alive. I also couldn't help but think of how close I had come myself to such a fate. Even an honest woman isn't safe on the streets. It could have been me instead of that Kelly woman. I could have been one of the victims of the Ripper, even though I am an honest woman and I keep to honest work. 